Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from bright and sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from the great state of Texas by Dr. Derek Love. How are you doing, Derek? Hey, I'm doing fine, John. How about yourself? I'm, I'm doing fantastic. And, and Derek is a distinguished educator and leadership consultant based in Texas and brings over two decades of experience and a wealth of expertise to the field. Uh, he's a degree in education leadership celebrated for his influential book, Self-Awareness in Leadership, Why the Best Leaders First Examine and Lead Themselves, Emphasizing Introspection and Effective Leadership. And that's what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about, and I just want to bring it up for a second, about the book. Here we go. It's on screen. Self-awareness in leadership, why the best leaders first examine and lead themselves. As you can see, it came out in December, so just released. So congratulations on that, Derek. Um, just to, to start off, just give give me a an idea of the genesis of where this book came from. And by the way, I think it's a fantastic subject because I think self-awareness is the key to almost everything in life. <laughs> it is, John. I think what what brought about this book was simply that um, I had been in education, educator and leader for 20 years, and I have had some of the most amazing bosses and some of the bosses that that led that didn't have at that level of self-awareness. And then as an early early in my career as a leader, John, I, I didn't have that great that the greatest level of self-awareness to do, to be able to lead effectively. So kind of in the in a sense, I wanted to rewrite a wrong. Uh, because some of those individuals that I led in my earlier career, man, John, I simply need to apologize because what I know today and what I've learned throughout these years of how to be more impactful through self-awareness and how to cultivate um, individuals and teams through self-awareness is where I am today. And so that became the, the premise and the why behind the book and why it's so important for us to be separate to be self-aware as it is the moral compass of how we lead, how we guide, and how we show up each day. Mm -hmm. And and what I really like about this, uh, like this, Derek, is that when is when people uh, get into a leadership position, uh, you know, they think first and foremost, okay, it's all about leading whoever it is, the people. But you make a you make an excellent point about the first thing is learning how to lead yourself, and I, that is something that people completely miss out on. It's like how do, how do I lead? How do I lead myself? Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's a piece that people get so fixated on leading other people that they completely ignore how they're leading themselves. Absolutely, John. I think one of the most fundamental things is that you got to understand your why. You got to understand who you are, your beliefs, your values, what you hold to be true. And that becomes a way of how to kind of internalize who you are as the individual. And then that once you are able to internalize that who you are as the individual, then it projects outwardly to the people that you do lead and how you are interact with them on a daily basis. And so it's very critical to understand for first and foremost, you as a person, as, as the individual, what makes you tick? What makes you happy? What makes you get up every morning and say, hey, I'm going to chase after this dream or I'm going to chase after how to be more impactful mm -hmm. in the organization today? Um, and so making sure that you are internalizing and hearing from within from from hearing from within so that it can manifest and project outwardly. And so that's why it's so critical to be able to lead your first to lead yourself first and to know who you are. You can't. John, there's no way you can able to lead someone if you don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us try day in and day out in leadership and in management and supervisory roles. And so we and so you wonder why the change is only systemic. It's not systemic, but it's it's short lived. It's not systemic. It's not sustaining. It's not you know, life altering or life changing. It's because we've led by our own emotions, our own will, our own egos, our own egotistical beliefs and perceptions and biases and all of those things that has clouded our vision as the clouds mm -hmm. our decision making. And so that is so why it's so important that you understand how do, how do you make effective decisions and what that looks like for you um, and how that process interacts with the people that you lead as yeah. well, too. 
Yeah, no, absolutely, and and I think the uh, the other the other part as well of that of that self awareness piece is, as you said, like once you understand who you are, etc. And then I think the other part then is is understanding how you engage and how you interact with other people. Because let's face it, there's some people that we just click with. It's easy. It suits us. We can communicate really easily with them. Other people, not so much. It's And it's very tempting for us then to just communicate with the people that we're, it's easy to communicate Correct. with. But that's but we have to start adapting and realizing there's five generations in the workplace today. I mean, just think about that and think about how you would communicate with somebody may of my generation as opposed to somebody of my 19 year old son's generation. But it's, it's so one of the one of the greatest things, John, I remember um, when I was leading in San Antonio and when the super my boss, she led a discussion on generation and how each generation communicates, which is very different. And I remember, John, a, a classic experience uh, that I experienced when I first came into administration. Um, and so here I am, this fresh 26 year old walking in as a principal and I had a veteran teacher who had been teaching 20 plus years, right? Mm -hmm. And so how I was used to communicating, and so that was a time frame where we would transition over to emails and using right. that more frequently and all of that. And so she's a baby boomer. She's looking like, hey, this is not for me. I don't want to do all that. And so if you're gonna communicate, you know, you can, you know, you can come by my you can come by my room or you can provide me with some information. You can give me put the the, the memo in my teacher box. And so and so that way, the way, the reverse way we was trying, not reverse, but we was trying to communicate is through email and making sure that that, that communication was going out through that uh, medium and forum. And so she was very kind of like agitated the whole time. And I just kept being persistent, kept being consistent in making sure, hey, this is the direction we're going. I know it may be hard, but I, I see you trying. And by the end, by the end of the year, we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And John, I can say about three years later, I was walking in a building one day uh, because I was supervising teachers at one time. And lo and behold, that same teacher came up to me and she says, you know what, Dr. Love, I want to first apologize to you <laughs> um, for just making your life miserable when you was trying to put some, you was trying to be forward thinking. Mm -hmm. um, because when I got into my new role, that was the way they were communicating. And I had that firsthand knowledge and firsthand experience of how to move that and do that. And so she was just like, thank you so much. And thank you for all that you did. And thank you for putting up with me. But that was very like a generational gap. I'm generation X, Y, and she's, mm -hmm. gener and she's a baby boomer. And so it was very different in that. But I learned that through consistency, through dedication, and through on just that ongoing commitment saying that, hey, we're going to we're going to champion this as a team and we're going to work together no matter what, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how many stumbling blocks there are, we're going to mitigate those stumbling blocks and then we're going to continue on. But that is one um, one quick story that I remember so vividly um, when you talked about generations and yeah. that level of communication. And, and I think you meant there's two there's two key phrases there or two key words that you mentioned there in that uh, in that uh, instance is number one, you said persistence. And the second one was consistency. So and I think those are really key things. I, you know, if 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 the leader is driving something, but if they're also driving a consistent message and why they're doing it and they're explaining it and they're being open and transparent. I think that I love that persistence and consistency. Very critical and key because in that in that consistency and persistence, you're going to get buy-in from those that you lead, and you want that collective buy-in to be able to move the vision of the goal, the organization, or uh, the, the the objective, the goals, to be able to move that in such a powerful and impactful way. And so, I, I've witnessed every on every front that that level of consistency, transparency, mm -hmm. but also, John, I want to add another yeah. one in here, and that's vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And being vulnerable at times, because I think when people see you as vulnerable, they see you as human, right? There is no hierarchical structure in that piece. Right. That means it's saying that I'm coming to walk alongside you in this journey, and we're going to walk together in this. And then when people see that you're walking together in that same vein and journey, then they're saying, well, hey, you know what? 
I'm ready to get on board with that vision. You know, what do you need me to do to help out to be an effective team player? Mm -hmm. um, what does that look like? And then so you as a leader are as able to articulate and continue to articulate that vision um, and that drive home of what the organizational goals are to achieve the level of success. And I think once you do that, it also creates another word, yeah. which is called synergy. And mm -hmm. that synergy, once it becomes contagious, it's 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 mind blowing because I believe yeah. great things happen when synergy is created. Oh yeah, for, for absolutely for sure. And I think the other part too is is Derek is that um, you know things have gotten more complicated. Let's face it. I mean, business, technology, all of this. There's so many different aspects to work, and there's so many jobs and roles and things that are so specific. And you need the expertise that as a leader, as a leader today, I think that's where you really need to bring in that you have that kind of personal humility or whatever to be able to, as you said, vulnerable to to be able to go. I'm as I, I'm you're on my team because you're an expert in this. I'm not the expert. You're the expert. Mm -hmm. And I think when you start to give away and start to say, yes, you know, this is what I'm good at, you know, and I'm the leader here. But these, this is why I need all of you because you're experts at what you do. And it's, again, it's, as you said, it elevates everybody to the same level. It does. I think one of the, the most fundamental things is that you don't have to be, as the leader, you don't have to profess or, or proclaim to be the smartest one in the room. Um, and so you cent you center yourself around the, uh, effective team members that's going to be able to contribute and add value in it because that value added makes, man, it, it, it promotes the greater good of the organization. And you want them to be able to grow and to develop and to, and to nurture their talents and their gifts so that it's very more impactful to the organization as a whole. And that is what it's all about. It's about the, it has to be greater than you, the individual. Mm -hmm. And self-awareness is saying that, hey, it's not about me. It's about the collective collective we. And when we work together, we achieve greatness. And greatness is it's inside of all of us. But it's a it's about I mean unpacking that level of greatness so that we all can contribute and work towards that common goal. Yeah. And then, you know, as a leader, I mean you said about like um, you know self-reflection and all of that. But as as a leader, how do you how do you advise leaders to help their teams become maybe a little more self-aware, maybe un understand things a little more from their own perspective, even how they operate in the world? Because I think I think this is, if, if you could start a self-awareness, you know, wave across the country across the world i think it'd be fantastic so how do you how, how do you advise leaders to help other people start their journey of self-awareness so i help leaders to start that journey in self-awareness just about um one of the things is an activity that we have i have an activity with that's identified in the book we have it a knowledge of self and then that knowledge of self will has eight characteristics that that talks about uh, vulnerability transparency open communication um and things of those and things of that nature and so what we're able to do is in a small group setting or a large group setting begin to reflect on that knowledge of self-will and where we are in that knowledge of self-will so what i may say what are two areas that you feel that are of strength and what are two areas or one area you feel like that you need to improve upon and so one person may say i believe that my level of communication is great um but that level of transparency is one of the, one of the areas mm -hmm. that I want to build upon. And then as a leader, as you're hearing those conversations, then it's our job to then take that and then kind of craft and mold that, that level of self-awareness in that individual is by helping them understand that transparency is the key and that when you are transparent, then it also impacts, because when you're non-transparent, it impacts everybody's workflow. But when you are transparent, we're able to complete that level of workflow even more effectively. And so we want to make sure that we are doing that that reflective piece and reflective thinking um, continuously. And I think that are, are some, it is a way of being able to kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, initiate this wave across mm -hmm. about becoming self-aware. But I do believe one of the things like this, and even in this bigger wave, is that we have to really begin to do self-introspection. And I do believe that as a leader, 
it's very critical to do like check-ins, like check-ins, and that's like one-on-one check-ins. And that's to kind of see the person for who they are. Not see, I mean, kind of really initiate conversation about who they are and what makes them tick. And I think once as a leader, you're able to understand what makes them tick and how that tick, how that tick helps the overall arching of the organization, then that begins another level, a layer of how to lead in that le level of self-reflection mm -hmm. um, and self-awareness. And so those are some things I would say that is, is kind of what could be a catalyst or kind of be um, a, a movement mm -hmm. in uh, pushing self-awareness. Yeah, and I, and I think the other thing that you referenced there too as well, which, which is important to underline, and that is, uh, and that is, uh, when you're when you're leading people, um, is really is really looking for what, as you said, what their strengths are, what they're really good at, what they love to do, all of those things. Because let's face it, you're going to be better at something that you actually are good at and like doing than you are. Right. But culturally, we always focus on, oh, yeah, well, here's all the areas that you're deficient in. Let's focus there on getting you right on that. And the fact is, you may never be good at any of those things. You're just wasting time. So so I think another part of the leadership is, is really looking at people, looking at their strengths, and then figuring out how can I maximize those strengths as opposed to fall into the trap of always trying to re and remediate people. I think that's very critical, though. I, I think it's, it's, it's crucial that we did, we hone in on the areas of strength and what makes them, the individuals uh, feel successful. I think when you mm -hmm. feel success, then you're able to even tap into some of the areas you feel like you may not be as successful in. And I think you're willing to try even harder to kind of tap into those areas of weakness. And you may not become the masterful uh, mm -hmm. uh, a skill one at some of those weak areas, but the one is to try to uh, overcome some of those challenges is what you wanted to be able to do. And then to continue on championing, uh, championing those level of areas of strength. And I think as a leader, it's, it's our responsibility to champion those things. I think what we get wrong is we trying to, you want to try to manage people. And I don't think that management is good in some, in some areas, um, but management only leads to, you know, short, temporal mm -hmm. things. But I think when you're leading in the sense, then you're, you're, you're building sustainability and, and greater support for the organization and the culture and the climate of the organization, I think is very critical, too. And so you want to and you want to maximize that culture and climate. And then, you know what? It's, it's so what I've also seen, too, is when you pair people who have a, a strength. They have this effective strength, and, and so the other one has this level of effective strength, and they feed off those strengths, but they also say where the one is weak in, they're able to support there in that in that space, and it, 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 it creates another level of cohesion and energy and synergy that creates another dynamics of culture that is also that produces great results for the organization. Yeah, no, I think that's a fa I think that's a fantastic point, and the and yeah, the more you can pair people, the more you can get that synergy. As you mentioned earlier, the the synergies when everybody's you know strengths are being maximized, and and people are collaborating, and they're and they're helping with uh, areas that other people aren't as aren't as strong in. I think that's 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 where the joy comes from. I think let's face it, at the end of the day. Uh, when all boats rise, you know, every, you know, there's an energy in that as opposed to just one or two. It is. It's definitely an energy in that. And then, you know, it's, I think one of the greatest things to do is, too is that, is that when we lead, um, it's very important just to, to, to lead, uh, to know people. Um, and I think that uh, once we're able to do that, then we're, like I said, overall, everything begins to, everything begins to um, evolve and take root. It's, and it's, it's, a, it's like a, a continuous growth piece and it's a continuous improvement model, always turning, always movement forward. And so in the book, also talking about just about how to be able to lead effective teams and how a leadership and leading teams is, is truly a talent. And then also is that how do we create shared vision and shared processes to lead not only ourselves, but the people that that we surround ourselves with. And then just knowing who you are as a leader and being self-aware. And I think the more that we can create more self-aware leaders in, in, in this 
next generation of more self-aware leaders, the more that we will put people into the world and into occupations and jobs and roles responsibilities that will make a global impact, that will make a global difference in our world today, and we will see a much better place. Yeah, no, absolutely. That be beautifully put, by the way. And uh, and 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 the other part too is, let's face it, um, with technology today, and, and we don't have time to get into this, but uh, you know, you're dealing with you 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 could be leading people from all four corners of the globe. You can all, as I said, like five different generations. All of this, like, there's so much diversity, and uh, and it's getting so uh, you know global and spread out, and all of that stuff that it is. That the, the the challenge is the challenge is getting uh, is getting harder I think in many ways, but also more exciting because as I said you can access to all of these people across the globe from every different background and whatever and so when you can build bring people together with skill sets but also with different experiences it's a it's a beautiful wow. thing. That, but John, I think that's powerful when you can bring people from different experiences and different walks of life and you bring them all into the room. And I think when you harness all of that level of talent in one space, man, uh, yeah. I think the outputs are like phenomenal. But I think it tell but all it takes a really self-aware leader to understand that role that you're here to facilitate you're not here to dominate dictate you're here to guide the process and move that process along and when you are the facilitator man you see the light bulbs that click on and off you see all the synergy that begins to burst and rises from the top and so it becomes not only like a bot you know it, it, it's mm -hmm. a top about i mean top down and bottom up we all meet in the middle but it is so amazing to see when we have leaders who role as a facilitator and a guide. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, this has been fantastic. All of Derek's information is going to be below this video. Uh, and there's the book, the latest book, as I said, just released on December 6th, Self-Awareness in Leadership, Why the Best Leaders First Examine and Lead Themselves. Uh, but before we go, uh, Derek, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Hey, yeah. So, so one of the things that I do, I am a career educator. I've been a career educator for the past 20 plus years, but I also am an executive coach. Um, I love coaching um, leaders to help them develop their skills and harness those skills, even though in degree. Um, working with leadership teams and building leadership teams and building capacity with those leadership teams and making sure that they are viable and running effectively uh, for the vitality of the organization and the overall health of the organization. And so I also have the CEO of a nonprofit entity that also looks at leadership consulting as well too. So that's a little bit who I am, but most importantly, I'm a humble servant. I'm a father of three. Um, I am married, and so I have been married for now for over 15 years, um, going nice. strong. And so we have three beautiful children that um, that keeps us young and youthful every day. <laughs> yeah, and, that's, a, that's a beautiful <laughs> thing. It is a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The old, yeah, they keep you younger while they age you at the same time. Correct. Correct. <laughs> correct. Hence all the gray, right? The gray. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So. But Absolutely. Yeah. Well, listen, Derek, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for the insights today. Again, go check out the book and check out uh, all of Derek's work. Uh, and thank you for watching. Thanks again to Derek, and I will see you all again soon. Thank you, John. I appreciate it.